Well, today's program is called From Darkness of the Shoah into Light. It's with um, Ben Midler, with David Lee Preston, and Lucy Adlington. Uh, David is from Philadelphia, Ben is from San Diego, and Lucy is from North in the UK. Um, I am balancing talking while admitting, so you can see a little bit of a struggle here, but you can see how many people are on board with us. Um, and we have uh, also a musical guest today, uh, Lekta uh, Lichtenberg, who's coming from us uh, via video from Toronto. So we're really excited for a really powerful show today. Um, and I see uh, Natan is from Israel. He's also a survivor. Nice to see you, Natan. Uh, welcome. And Abe, uh, if you are with us, can you tell us where you're from and um, where you're where you are now? Hi, Jeffrey. Uh, good to be here. <clears throat> My name is Abe Maslach, and I'm from Fremont, California. Very good. And Julia, if you can unmute, let us know um, who you are and where you're from. Thank you. Can we hear you? Yep. All right, I'll come back to you. Ruth, nice to see you. Ruth is from Seattle and she is a Holocaust survivor Oregon. from where? I'm sorry, Oregon, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm from Oregon. Uh, yeah, and she's a Holocaust survivor, child survivor from Vienna. So glad to have your back. Um, let me see if there's others there are here. Um, we have uh, David Tabaski, please. Anybody who can come on, we'd love to take this few minutes to say hello. Dana, Sarah, um, uh, Miriam, if you can come on screen. Yifat, Sarah, Rita Heller. Nice to hear. Nice to see you, Rita. And But we can't see you, but I'm glad you're with us. Um, but we are getting a very large uh, turnout. We already have over 40 people with us. And uh, Rhonda, tell us a little bit where you're from. Do I see Rhonda? How about Dana or Michelle, Michella? If you can unmute yourself, Michella, we can, you can tell us where you're from. You ask me? Yes. So I am from the Czech Republic, from Prague. Okay. I knew uh, Lenka when she was about 13, 14 years old. But then she emigrated, she married into Canada. So I wanted to listen to the Holocaust stories because I'm myself a survivor of Terezin. And well, that's about all. Okay, well, Michelle, if you can send me, if you can tell me how, if you can give me your email address in the chat, I'd love to follow up and, uh, and talk to you about your but background. I'm I'm all the time getting the mail from. Oh, well, that's perfect. That's all I need. Yes. <laughs> Good. Well, Otherwise, I'm glad that you're here from the Czech. You're the first Czech Republican, Czech Republic person that has come to the program live, and I'm thrilled. So, welcome. I, welcome. I am in the in the um, Terezin Initiative wow, in the wow. board of the Terezin Initiative. So wow, it's wow, wow. Part of my duty also. <laughs> Terrific. And you'll hear. Well, I'm also particularly happy to, to that you've joined us today. I've spent so long looking at life in Czechoslovakia and studying women from Prague and Bratislava who survived Auschwitz. So what a, what a pleasure to see you today. And uh, well, I'm, I'm lucky that I wasn't in Auschwitz. I was only, well, only. Interesting. Only, it, it's all tough, isn't it? I'm so pleased that you're here. So, Mikhaila, how close are you to Kosice, Czechoslovakia? Sorry? How close Look, are you to Kosice, Czechoslovakia? To what? Kosice. Excuse me, but my English K is not... K-O-S-I-C-E. Kosice. My mother was from Kosice, Czechoslovakia. Košice, uh, Michaela. Košice, Čekoslo in Slovakia. That's in Slovakia. That's about um, 300 kilometers from Prague, I think. Okay. Very good. 
That's right, very everyone. east. All right, I'm going to uh, sort of go through the tech check now so everyone understands a little bit how these programs go for those of you who are new. Um, we are using a multimedia. Uh, we'll use some um, PowerPoint decks, some videos today. So if you happen to lose your connection, just come and click on the original invitation link and I will admit you right back into the program. Um, we also have many people here, so we have to have a sort of an orderly Q&A. So as you have questions, I want you to go to the chat. Just click on the chat right now. You'll see um, pretty much some of the programming highlights. You're welcome to, as the program goes on, if you have a question, put your question in chat. When we get to the end, we do our Q&A after the three speakers are finished. I will go to those questions that are in chat first before I open it up to uh, a general Q&A forum. Jeff, could you take off the recording? Announcement about the recordings? Click. Yes, click yeah. it's, always, it's always going to be on the screens because everyone oh, right. that okay. it's going to be there. No, he needs, he needs to click got it so then it, that the page yeah. will disappear. I'll click on the words got it. Yes, you have to click on your screen because it's being recorded. Accept to the, accept. User, the user has to click got it. So you accept that you're being recorded. So glad that you could bring that up. Thank you. Um, Rita, nice to see you. Uh, now you're coming on. Um, also, so to, additionally, we when we have our Q&A, I want you to go over to the bottom of your screen or wherever you will have it on your toolbar. There's a reactions button. If you click on that reactions button and you'll see raise hand, you will see that in my screen, I now up here have a raised hand. This will allow me to quickly see you have a question. And when you do that, if, if you're on the second or third screen, we're going to have multiple screens. We already have two. Your question will bring your tile to the first screen so I can easily see it. So that's very helpful for me. I am a one man band here admitting and doing the questions. So we and doing the program. So it's something that um, just helps me. We want to um, we want to get started. Uh, I want to let you know, unfortunately, um, Ben had um, Ben will be first, uh, but Ben had a, uh, a, a very close friend, a survivor pass away uh, at the end of last week. So he's going to leave us. You won't be available for uh, Q&A. He has a funeral today. So if anybody has questions for Ben, He's available on Facebook through private messaging, and um, that's how you can answer, ask Ben your question. The other thing I wanted to ask, um, and I'm starting this as a new thing, is anybody have a birthday that you're celebrating in July? And if you are, uh, I would like to have you raise your hand and let me know so we can acknowledge your birthday. So I know Ben has a birthday. Ben had a birthday at, in late June, and I'm gonna give you credit because I didn't start this in June, but Ben turned 94, God bless him. So what a uh -huh. horrific, uh, horrific uh, milestone. Is there anybody else who has a birthday? Use the, use the, the reactions button and raise your hand uh, so I can see you. If not, uh, Eva, is that you? You have a birthday too? So happy birthday to you. And um, for you, I'm going to uh, also share my screen. And I've got to figure this out, so just bear with me. So I want to wish both of you a happy birthday. <laughs> huh. Because I'm happy. Clap along if you feel like a room without a roof. Because I'm happy. Clap along if you feel like a room without a roof. Because I'm happy. Clap along if you feel like happiness is the truth. Because I'm happy. Clap along if you know what happiness is. You hey. Because I'm happy. Clap along if you feel like that's what you want. So happy birthday, Ben. <laughs> happy birthday, Eva. So glad you. you're with us to celebrate your birthday. And this will be a normal uh, part of our uh, 
part of our gig here. So uh, glad to have you with us. So Ben, I'm going to, uh, doesn't really need an introduction and he's gonna tell you his life story and his life story is his bio. So I'm just gonna introduce Ben Midler, my friend uh, from San Diego and Ben will start the program. So take it away, Ben. Okay, my name is Ben Midler. I was born on June 27, 1948. In, in eastern part of Poland, the city of Bialystok. And uh, we had a good life before the Nazis came in. Na, na, Germany, the Nazi of Germany occupied all uh, Europe and uh, Poland was no, no exception. On September 25, they uh, made war with Poland and it didn't take more than a week. They occupied all Poland. The only thing is they didn't stay long because they find out later they had an agreement with Russia because they were afraid to Russia not opening up a second front. So they let Russia occupy the eastern part of Poland. So this way, after one week, the Russian came back to eastern part of Poland, including Bialystok. They were under Russian occupation for two years. And life was almost the same because Bialystok was a very Jewish city in an industrial city. Just to sell you this, 65% uh, of the population of Białystok were Jewish. So in the streets, you could hear Yiddish and not Polish. And in, uh, in June 1922, Germany declared war on Russia and they moved into Poland on June 27. The uh, first thing they did, they told all the Jewish people to put on a, a star so they know they are Jews because uh, they, they would like to make a difference between the Poles and the Jews. On July, they rounded up 5,000 Jews, put them to the forest outside the city and they killed them. Between them, my father and one of my uncles, my mother's brother, we never saw them again. After uh, another month in August, they declared that all Jews got to move in uh, to the ghetto. So because our house was not in the ghetto, we moved into my uncle in uh, another street on Wozka Street. And over there, we were in a small bedroom. Um, my family, my mother at that time, and I had a brother and a sister. My brother's name was Arie, my, my uh, sister was Matilda, and, uh, and my grandmother, and another uh, 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 woman, but she was a, a wife of the uncle when they took over and they killed him. After a, a, a very food was rationing, so they saw too many people out there. A lot of people from the western part of uh, uh, Poland started running away. They came to Russia, I mean to Bialystok, and uh, the, the Russian told them to take Russian passport. They refused. The reason they refused because they wanna, they left some fa their families, some of them in the western part of Poland, and they wanna go back, so they didn't took the passport. So the Russian took all these people and they put them on train, took them to Siberia, and they were lucky because they were, they were alive today. <laughs> in nineteen, in February of nineteen forty-three, they rounded up people and they. Uh, it took him to Treblinka. We find out later where they took him, only we didn't know at that time. Because they saw the deporting Jews, so my uncle decided to build the hiding place. We, we didn't have any uh, basement, we had cellars. In the cellar, going out to the garden, we put in a hiding place, and we were over there, 40 people. It's muted. Yeah, he's muted. And you have to unmute yourself. Somehow you got muted. There you go, Matt. Go ahead. In uh, August 1943, they declared to liquidate the ghetto. So, because we, we had already uh, hiding plates, so we were hiding in the, in the hiding place, all the families that ever lived in this house, including my, my other two uncles and their families. 
So what happened? This for uprising, a lot of Jews, young Jews, decided to, uh, they couldn't fight back because they only had guns. So what they did, they start burning the houses, wooden houses was by the fence of the ghetto to stop from coming in so some people could run away to the forest. Because we smelled smoke, my uncle and his son and me, we went out to check and the Germans were waiting for us in the yard and they took us on a march to our side of the city to a field named Petrasche and over there were uh, trains taking the people to different places. We didn't know where we're going, on the, only we knew from before that they take him to Treblinka. On the third day, a few Germans had with canes, some canes got around the anvil, so they rounded up 500 people. They, but, and uh, I was between them, my uncle and his son, and they put us in three separate cars. All the cars, the train, the rest of the cars, they went to Treblinka. Only us, they put on a separate line and then they come back, the locomotive come back and took us to the first camp, Maidanek. I was in six camps and I wanted, uh, the German kept good records and the Red Cross took over all the records and I got a record show. This is show this I was in six concentration camps. Maidanek, Regin, Birkenau, Sachsenhausen, Ordruf, and Babisberg. Maidanek, we didn't stay long. A few uh, uh, rest nights people came over with uh, a few officers and they declared everybody should say wherever I worked in the ghetto, we want to know where they work. My uncle, because he worked a mechanic for the army, he told me I should take the same, I'm a mechanic. And he, he told me, he'll tell me what to do. All I have to do is hold the wrench. When they came to me, I was scared. So I told them I was a presser because that's what I did to, to be able to stay, not to be taken in February. So I worked as a presser in a tailor shop. It so happened when the German made war with Russia, they were, it was in uh, 1943 and they needed a lot of warm clothes. So they looked for tailors and shoemakers. So because I was a presser as part of the tailor's uh, profession, so they sent us to another camp. My uncle was never, I never saw him again. When I came back in 2004 to, with my family to visit Poland and the camps, was a, a plague. This all the Jews in November of 93 was taken, wherever was not murdered, was taken out to a forest and got killed. In Blijin, they didn't need pressers because the uh, Army clothes don't, no, don't need to be pressed. I worked in a stone quarry to break up stones so they could use for the, to build the highways. In Blijina was a year, uh, the food was very little. In the morning was a slice of bread with a little margarine at lunchtime soup. And the soup, you got a fish to, to look for a potato or, veg, or vegetables. It was almost like bouillon soup. At night, a bigger slice of bread with margarine and jelly. Over there, I got typhus because the uh, sanitary condition was very bad. We, we couldn't take no showers, only washing the face. And going to the bedroom during the day, they had a block, was only a, with a stone with all the inside, and people would go to the bedroom. At night, we had to do to a pail. And in, in the morning would take him out. After uh, a year being in Blijin, the Russian front came closer. So they took us on a march. Uh, they took us on trains and they took us to Birkenau. In Birkenau, we went through a selection. And because uh, I was uh, young people, wherever I was short, they had a, a measurement two pieces of wood and uh, because I was short, so I stand up on my toes and I pass through. After this election, I uh, was in Birkenau and the, the barracks were uh, with uh, uh, around 200 people and uh, 
was very uh, crowded. And uh, after the, the front, the Russian front came again close, we couldn't get the trains. They couldn't bring the trains to Birkenau. So the measures are work. The only place wherever they put on a number on the uh, survivor, on the Holocaust people, was uh, only Birkenau. My number is B, 2433. The rest, wherever was in the camps, all they put on a pizza fabric with the number. Wherever died, the number died with them. After we worked for, because they couldn't bring the train, so we worked uh, for a week between uh, farmland because they were afraid to take us on the freeways. We walked for a week until they got trains and they took us to Sachsenhausen. When they brought us to Sachsenhausen, we were there about two months and they looked for volunteers to go to another camp. I uh, volunteered and they sent me to Ordruf. In Ordruf, I was about three months over there, they built uh, a factory in the mountain. Uh, because it, uh, the, was, uh, they needed again volunteers to another place. I volunteered again, and they took me to Babesberg Kepenik. That's a, a suburb of Berlin, because they needed people to clean the streets after the Allied uh, planes bumped during the night, they bombed the big cities of uh, Germany, like uh, uh, Berlin uh, and many, many other cities. When, uh, I, uh, after about f five months, in May 1948 of 1945, I got liberated. How did I find out we got liberated? We woke up in the morning, we didn't see any guards. We were liberated by the Russian, and I tried right away to go back to Poland. And uh, I caught a Russian train, one of the Jewish officers. By the only Russian train from the army was going back to Russia. So what they did, they took all the machinery from all the factories back to Russia. When we came back to Poland, they had were Jews, were Polish people, militia waiting for us with guns, and they were looking for Jews. The officer told us, once you come to Russia, help us unload the train, then you could go back. Once you go into Russia, you can't get out. I worked in a commissary on the, on the army camp for six months, and finally I found a secretary, but she's on the branch, but they stay on the border, and I asked her if I could get, could get me a, a, a uh, a, 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 a receipt or something, or a signature of a, to go for two weeks vacation because I find out my family is alive. She said, I can't give you any, any documents. I'll give you a, a paper with a common signature. You write wherever you want. I wrote up for two weeks vacation. I came back to Bialystok. I didn't find any Jews, wherever I, I knew Jews living on the street of Kupiecka, I tried to knock on the doors, nobody answered. I found a few people, they told me there's nobody here, any Jews almost. Once you go to Lodz, there's another city where uh, Israeli uh, counselors are waiting to take survivors to Israel. How did they end up in Poland? Because uh, a Jewish brigade from Israel worked alongside the British army against the Nazis. I was in a kibbutz with young people for six months. We went to Czechoslovakia, uh, Hungary, to Italy. We were waiting for uh, boats to take us to Israel. When we, after, a couple, after a couple months, we got a fishing boat and it uh, was almost very crowded, like three to 400 people on a small fishing boat. When we came to the Israel, the border of Israel, the British army was waiting for us and they didn't let us in. The British had a mandate over uh, Palestine. Israel at that time was called Palestine and they only let in 1,500 people, Jews a month. 
So they took us on their ships and they took us to the city of Famagusta in Cyprus. I was there six months until uh, December of 1946 when I came into Israel. In Israel, I didn't have any profession, so I asked him if I could go, be able to learn some profession. They told me, we don't teach any profession. The only we could send you is to agricultural school. So I went to agricultural school over there, four hours of study and four hours to work in the fields. In 1947, the UN declared these the Jews are entitled to their own country. So in 1948, the prime minister at that time was Ben Gurion. He declared that Israel should own, own their own state. Six countries surrounding Israel declared war on Israel. So the, uh, all the <coughs> men and women from 18 to 55, they uh, drafted to the army. I was in the Palmach for two years. I was uh, on the last uh, convoy going to Jerusalem. And then the Jordanian cut off the road between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, in Latrun. There was a police station, and uh, we couldn't travel. So we were under siege for three months before the, all over Jerusalem, in the suburbs, in the city itself. And then the army find a way between the mountain to uh, open up another road between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. I fought all over Israel in the two years. And after a couple of months, we, we didn't know what we were going to do. So because we were about 25 people from the uh, from the school, Magdiel, the agricultural school, we decided to go build a farm, a village of farmers. I did, didn't want to be a farmer, so I worked to be the uh, go between the, 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 the Sochnut, I don't know how to say the, the name in English. There's uh, like the Jewish, government. Jewish agency. Jewish agency between the, them and the farmers. I got married after six months of uh, uh, dating. I married a nice lady. How did I marry her? Because we had a counselor who was, was teaching us how to do the farming. So he was from the village of Nalal. And over there was a school of only girls. So they took us on a bus and they took us to Nalal and we went to a movie together. And then I met my wife and we got married after six months in June of 19, in January of 1951. My uh, friend married even uh, my wife's sister, so we had a double wedding. After three years being on the uh, farm, we had to move because uh, the Arabs would come to, to, to uh, every night and try to steal stuff. So we were shooting through the windows and my daughter was crying all night. So we tried to move. We moved to Haifa. I worked at a milk dairy because my father was a milk distributor in Poland. So I worked at a milk dairy for four years. Everybody, wherever was a survivor, filled out forms to Yad Vashem. This is looking for people. I filled out too. And I find out this, I got an aunt living in Argentina. How did I find out? It's the only way I knew her that she moved because she got married in 1938. And I know her married name. If I would knew her maiden name, I would never find her. So by knowing her married name, I found her. And she told me I got three another aunts, my wife's mothers, my mother's uh, sisters living in Chicago. They're looking for me. So they sent, they looked for me in Israel. They sent somebody to look for me. And they say, because you're the only one survivor from five families, my grandfather had 11 kids. Three of them were living in Argentina, three were living in the United States, and five were living in Poland. And from all the five families, nobody was alive except me. So we decided to move to the United States. At that time, I already had two kids. So we came to the United States. I worked for uh, one year in the grocery store, and I saw it's not enough money to, to, be, to have for the family. So I went and I 
the only profession I know, and I went to work in a milk dairy. I worked for 18 years from working in the cooler and on the uh, in other uh, uh, places. I did uh, my son-in-law, uh, my oldest daughter, husband, had a father, but he had a lot of trouble with his heart. So he told me, why don't you come? I'll take leave of absence for six months, work by me for two months, and learn the profession of selling parts to mechanics for cars. So I went, and he said, this way, you'll have a better job, and you'll have more money. I, did, I agreed, I worked for two months, and his father changed his mind, so I went back to work in the dairy. Only he didn't take more from another four months, and his father died, so he came the opportunity, to ask me if I want to buy the store. I say, I sure I want to buy it. And my wife asked me, you sure you could do it? I say, I have to do it. There's nothing out if you got willpower to do it. If you got willpower, everything is possible to make it coming. I worked five years. I, I had five years the business. Only I find out I got prostate cancer and they told me I have surgery in two months. You can have a business where the mostly is cash sales and have somebody run it. So I decided to sell it and move. So I sold it and I moved to San Diego. I worked again in uh, auto parts for six years into my retirement and I lived in San Diego for 38 years. And uh, the only reason I start writing the, the story, my grandkids in 1990 came over with a, a computer. At that time, Macintosh computers had like a radio, a small box. And they said, Grandpa, you got a radio story. I never talked to my kids about the Holocaust because I didn't want to bother them. And they should, they should feel sorry for me. So I didn't talk from, uh, from 19... Since from 45 until 1980 or 90, I didn't speak about the Holocaust to nobody. After I wrote a story and I wrote a book, the child from Bialystok, child survivor from Bialystok, Poland. This book, you could get it on Amazon. It took me three years to write it. Only uh, I made it. And since then, I'm going to schools and I speak all over. They ever ask me only to speak about the Holocaust. I never gi give up, and that's my duty, because the things that happened to me by choosing me to put in three separate cars, choosing me to deciding I should move from one camp to another, that somebody was watching over me, and if God watched over me, and I got to pay it back by telling the story to everybody, so it shouldn't happen again. We should never forget about the Holocaust. Like Elie Weisel said, when you talk to people, you are a witness and they are witnesses too. So that's why I decided to speak to everybody in every time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. I have a question for you. I, I wanna let the audience know who maybe didn't hear it. Ben lost a very close friend in the, um, life club here in the survivor life club here in San Diego. She was also a survivor. So Ben has a funeral and he will be leaving. If you have questions for Ben. Jeff, you're not speaking loud enough. Something is going on. Okay. Uh, I have, how about now? Can you hear me now? Okay. So Ben is uh, going to be leaving us in around 11 o'clock. Um, so any questions that you have for Ben, you can reach out to him on Facebook and his private message. I'd love for you to tell us about uh, a little bit about your wife, of blessed memory, because um, I think she's such a big part of your life. So um, can you share a little bit about her? Yes. My wife was born in Cairo, Egypt. Her name was Shemtov. Uh, I married, in, like I say, in 1951. She only died eight months ago. And uh, we had a 70 year long marriage. Uh, she was very, always smiling and she was loved by everybody. Even today when the people meet me, she said, 
you lucky you had a, a, a wonderful wife. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Thank you so much for uh, presenting your life story. I want one thing to say, two, two, two lines I want to read for my uh, grandson, what they wrote about me. He, he wrote it when he was 34, he's now 38, he only married last year. I wanted to send you a quick note, wishing you the, the happiest of birthdays. I wish I could be there today in all the days to celebrate you, Asish. You mark so special milestone, an example for set for your kids, your grandkids, and now the great great kids. You have always been the emotional center of his family in the rock and strength that has shown us the way to go about the, our lives. We will probably don't say it enough to you directly. Thank you. Thank you for everything you do for the whole family, for the person you are, for what you have preserved through an inspiration you are to all of us. Thank you. Beautiful. Now, also, you told me once a story between about you and your brother, and I would love for you to be able to tell our audience that story. You you survived to ninety four. He did not. Why do you think? Because uh, he was left in the hiding place, and I couldn't find, and I never heard from him again. I went back to Poland. I went to the place where we lived and there was no more hiding place because they took down the whole house, it was taken down. Okay. All right, thank you, Ben. And I'm You're going welcome. to I'm, I'm going to now screen share. I'm going to bring our musical guest uh, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about her. So hold on one second. Uh, our musical guest is from Toronto. Her name is Lenka Lichtenberg. She's a Canadian musician, composer, and producer who draws on the rich into intercultural Toronto soundscapes to create her own unique global sound. She has won the Canadian Folk Music and International Independent Music Awards. Lenka's latest project is Thieves of Dreams, based on the poems she recently unearthed that were written by her grandmother while she was being held in Terrorstadt camp, uh, concentration camp during World War II. So let me uh, just get there quickly. Hold on, sorry. Give me one second, I'm sorry. Ich 
und sie sah jeder weißgläserne Knopf, wie er träg, wo es fließt von die Falten herab, versteinert und schwer. Thank you, Lenka. It was a beautiful uh, introduction. So I am going to now um, turn it over to our next guest, our next speaker, and that is um, David Lee Preston. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about David. Harry Hoffman is this? Sorry, hold on a second. Uh -huh. Okay, here it goes. Uh, David Lee Preston is a retired journalist who spent four decades as a reporter, columnist, and editor at the Philadelphia Inquirer. His father, George Preston, survived both Auschwitz and Buchenwald, then had a long career as an engineer with the DuPont Company in Wilmington, Delaware. His mother, Helena Wynn Preston, a Jewish educator, hid for 14 months in the sewers of Lviv and was, the, was among the first survivors of the Nazis to speak publicly throughout the United States. David was a finalist for the 1986 Pulitzer Prize in feature writing for The Journey to My Father's Holocaust, one of three cover stories he wrote about his parents in the Philadelphia Inquirer's Sunday Magazine. His Mother's Day 1983 piece, A Bird in the Wind, published five months after his mother's death, was the English language account of the Lviv sewer story, later told by Anatesca Holland, Oscar-nominated 2011 movie um, called In Darkness. He's currently working on a translation of his mother's Polish language writings from Lviv sewers in 1943 and 1944. He lives in Philadelphia with his wife of 30 years, Rhonda Goldfein, who I met this morning, 
executive, executive director of the AIDS Law Project of Pennsylvania. So welcome, David, to the Jewish Culture and Holocaust Remembrance Group, um, and um, take it away. Thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, uh, bef before Ben goes, I just want to thank him personally for his very moving presentation. And, uh, and I also can't help but say what, what a moving and powerful uh, piece of music uh, th that you shared with us, Jeffrey, by, by Lenka. That was just really spectacular. Uh, so shalom, everybody from Philadelphia. It's an honor to appear on the program along with uh, Mr. Midler and Lucy Adlington. And Jeffrey, I want to commend you for your efforts at teaching the lessons of the Holocaust in memory of your own parents. Thanks to everyone for, for tuning in. You're going to hear me say a lot of dates and names, and you can't be expected to keep them all straight without a scorecard. So I invite everyone to explore my website. I put the web address in the chat area. It's davidleepreston.com, where you'll find much more than what time permits me to discuss today. I also want to thank many friends who I see on here, including David Tabatsky, um, who came from Manchester, Connecticut, where my uncle was a rabbi and, and David's father was the cantor. And listening to this beautiful uh, rendition of this Yiddish poem uh, reminds me that after my mother survived 14 months in the sewers of Lviv, uh, my uncle Leon arranged for a congregant in Manchester to send a new dress to my mother uh, who was still in Europe after the war. I was a little boy reclining with my mother in the sun on a Delaware beach when the reverie was interrupted by the words that have remained fixed in my brain for more than 60 years. One day, she told me, you will write my story. Please note that this was not a request. First slide, please, Jeffrey. Sure. Hold on, I have to share my screen, sorry. That's okay. Some of you may have attended my wedding to my wife, Rhonda Goldfein, 30 years ago in Wilmington, Delaware. In fact, I know that Kirsten Lagatry, who's on this call, was among those who attended that wedding. But even if you weren't there in person, you might be among the millions around the world who read about my wedding and about my mother in James McBride's eloquent epilogue of his best-selling 1995 book, The Color of Water. Our wedding was co-officiated by my late uncle, Rabbi Leon Wind, whom I just mentioned, of Manchester, Connecticut. And as it happens, two days ago, July 15th, Mark 21, sorry, 71 years since my uncle Leon officiated at another wedding in our family. It was at his Connecticut synagogue in 1951 when Helena Wynn married George Preston. Next slide, please, Jeffrey. Oops. Helena was 29 years old and George was 37. 
but the years don't explain the sadness in their faces. It was the first wedding dance for either of them. Yet if they seemed forlorn and lost in thought, this was a dance they would have wished their parents could have witnessed. A dance that neither bride nor groom could have imagined in the terrifying circumstances of their lives just a few years earlier. They were born in different parts of what is today Western Ukraine. My father in the city now called Rivne, and my mother in a little town in the Carpathian Mountains called Turka. Two different worlds, really. The bustling Jewish cultural Mecca in Volinia and the tiny hard scrabble mountain outpost in Galicia. And they didn't know each other until fate brought them together in the United States. Their marriage would last 31 years, ending when my mother died following open heart surgery in a Philadelphia hospital in 1982. She was 60. George got to America first in March of 1946, and he outlived Helena in terms of years, dying in 2006 at the age of 92. A French educated engineer arrested by the Gestapo in Lille in August 1942, he would survive Auschwitz Birkenau as a slave laborer for Siemens, making dyes for parts for German submarines in a subcamp called Bobrak. In that infamous place, Auschwitz, from November 1943 until January 1945, he witnessed the worst of man's inhumanity to man, personified by his barracks capo, Emil Bednarek, who was known to beat inmates to death for the slightest infraction. As the Russians approached, George was evacuated in a death march to Buchenwald, where he was liberated by the US Army on April 11, 1945 a walking skeleton whose father and brother had meanwhile been killed in a mass murder of Jews in his hometown in 1941. My father was born Grisha Grishkulnik, and I was named for his father, my grandfather, a businessman named Dovid Leib Grishkulnik. Alina arrived in the US almost a year after George in January, 1947. She was born Fija Wind, her Hebrew name Tsipora, the daughter of a poor, pious Hasidic watchmaker of the Belzer sect. She said he was saintly. In November, 1942, after the Germans had killed most of the Jews in her town, but still needed the watchmaker, her parents placed around her neck a Virgin Mary medallion from the watchmaker's shop. And at the age of 20, she took on the identity of a Polish Catholic girl she had known in school, Halina Naszkiewicz, and boarded a pre-dawn train for the big city, Lwów, known today as Lviv. There, she would end up hiding in the sewers for 14 months, one of 10 Jews saved by three Polish Catholic sewer workers at the risk of their lives and their families' lives, a story now known, as Jeffrey mentioned, throughout the world by virtue of Agnieszka Holland's Oscar-nominated 2011 movie, In Darkness. Throughout that ordeal, the one thing that kept Halina going, that kept her spirits up, strangely, was an address in New York, 3080 Broadway, the address of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Whatever terrible fate would have befallen her parents and her brilliant younger brother while she was in hiding, and they likely were murdered at Sambor or Belgitz, she knew that her brother Leon 
had sailed from Europe in 1938 with a precious student visa to study at 3080 Broadway. She also had been accepted to study there in the Seminary's Teachers Institute, but the outbreak of war had prevented her from leaving. In September of 1947, eight months after arriving in New York and only three years after emerging from the sewers of Lviv, she finally entered the Teachers Institute where she wrote an essay that was produced under the title of her Hebrew name, Tzipora, on the NBC radio program, The Eternal Light, on Sunday, September 19th, 1948. Soon, she would be one of the first survivors of the Nazis to speak publicly throughout the United States. She was a 27-year-old senior in the Teachers Institute when she spoke on October 25th, 1949 at B'nai Jeshurun Congregation on West 88th Street in New York City, the sixth annual Torah Fund Conference of the National Women's League of the United Synagogue of America, the first American audience to hear of the Lviv sewer episode. Her presentation was so powerful that the seminary sent her on a speaking tour and so from 1949 to 1953, she made 39 appearances in 30 cities in nine states and the District of Columbia. It was at one of those talks at Bethel Synagogue in Camden, New Jersey on the afternoon of Tuesday, December 13, 1949, that a woman named Diana Sherman heard her speak and afterward contacted a cousin working as an engineer with Stone and Webster in Boston. On Thursday, April 6, 1950, she wrote to that cousin, George Preston, about, quote, a very attractive young lady, close quote, who had spoken at her synagogue. Quote, her speech was about her experiences she lived through during Nazi terrorism. She spoke so effectively that her speech was printed in a magazine so that those who did not hear her story could read it. She is not an ordinary girl. She is strikingly good looking, intelligent, and has fine feelings, close quote. Next slide, please, Jeffrey. Just days after that letter, Halina spoke on Wednesday, April 12, 1950, at Temple Mishkan Tefillah, in Boston's Roxbury section. And George must have thought he was destined to meet her because that Sunday, April 16th, 1950, the Boston Globe ran a front page story headlined, Woman Lives to Tell of 14 Months in Sewer. On June 18th, 1950, Helena received her Bachelor of Religious Education degree from the Teachers Institute and on July 24th, she was hired to teach at Temple Anshe Chese on West End Avenue at 100th Street for the 1950-51 school year. They started dating and George began to look for a job in New York to be closer to Halina. He answered a help wanted ad in the New York Times for the DuPont Company which was seeking engineers. He took a test at the Empire State Building and they hired him on the spot. When do I start, he asked. The job is not in New York, he was told. It's in Wilmington, Delaware. And so I was born in 1955 in Wilmington, Delaware, where George went on to a 44 year career as an engineer with DuPont, and he continued his artistic pursuits, painting and sculpting that he had started in Europe. DuPont put him in charge of the electrical aspects of the spinning machines at textile fibers plants in Chattanooga and Beaumont 
and Seaford. And his initiatives were documented in a corporate magazine as having saved the company more than $20 million. My sister, Sherry, was born in 1961 in Wilmington. She would end up studying at the same seminary as our mother and our uncle. And she has been a leader at Jewish congregations throughout the US. She also helped my uncle Leon officiate at my wedding. And she's here with us today. Next slide, please, Jeffrey. In 1965, when I was 10 years old, my father was invited to testify at the Auschwitz war crimes trials in Frankfurt am Main. His testimony helped convict his Auschwitz capo, Emil Bodnarik, who was sentenced to life imprisonment for 14 counts of murder. You can listen to my father's emotional 1965 English language testimony on my website. Upon his return to Wilmington after appearing in the German courtroom, my father was interviewed in our dining room by a reporter for the Wilmington News Journal named George Kennedy. As a boy of 10, I watched from the second floor balcony. I've often thought that the experience of seeing a young stranger welcomed into our home, asking pointed questions that my father patiently answered, and then seeing my father's picture in the next day's paper with an article written by that stranger was the formative experience that led me on the path toward a career in journalism. A decade later, as fate would have it, George Kennedy was my professor at the University of Missouri School of Journalism. Next slide, please. During three decades in Delaware, my mother inspired students and audiences of all faiths with the story of the Lviv sewer workers who saved her, establishing herself as the state's eloquent representative of the victims and survivors of the Nazis. Her message was uplifting about how goodness transcends religion and ethnicity and national boundaries, continuing from one generation to the next, from, from one culture to another. Here she is shown on Sunday, December 2nd, 1979, exactly to the day three years before her death, dedicating the Holocaust monument in downtown Wilmington flanked by dignitaries, including U.S. Representative Thomas B. Evans, Jr., former Delaware Attorney General J. H. Albert Young, Delaware Supreme Court Chief Justice Daniel Herman, Governor Pierre S. Pete DuPont IV, and Mayor William T. McLaughlin. In 1978, my mother told an interviewer I had a mission. I wasn't just saving my life. And when you have a purpose and when you have a cause, then you are able to endure everything. I was living for my parents. I was living for my brother. I was living for my yet unborn children. I was living for the past and I was living for the future. Next slide, please, Jeffrey. On a chilly November morning in 1981 on the front lawn of the Jewish Community Center in Wilmington, my mother presided over a ceremony dedicating a grove of trees in memory of the so-called righteous Gentiles. Patterned after a memorial at Israel's Yad Vashem, the grassy clearing had saplings with wooden markers bearing names of European Christians who had rescued Jews who came to live in Delaware. One by one that morning, swelling with emotion, survivors came forward to unveil markers. 
also in attendance and honored with a tree was a Dutch Christian couple who lived in the state. Two trees bore plaques for two Polish Catholic sewer workers, Leopold Socha and Stefan Wroblewski. My mother died a year later at age 60, but she had fulfilled a sacred duty. Soon a monument was added. Bronze plaques replaced the wooden markers. And on December 11th, 1983, more than 700 people packed the center's auditorium to hear the Methodist theologian and Holocaust scholar, Franklin Littell, formally dedicate the garden. My mother maintained contact with the Socha and Wroblewski families. As a boy, I watched her meticulously prepare parcels of clothing that she sent them throughout the difficult post-war years in Soviet-occupied Poland. My mother traveled to Jerusalem in 1977 to provide the sole testimony that led to Socha and Wroblewski and their wives being named righteous among the nations, enabling the two families to receive monthly stipends and establishing them among the nearly 28,000 heroic figures from 51 countries upon whom Yad Vashem has now formally accorded the honor. My mother made a career as a Jewish educator in Delaware and as the state's preeminent spokeswoman for the survivors and victims of the Holocaust. But I did not set out to specialize in writing about the Holocaust. As a young reporter, I had covered county government and seven murder trials for the Kansas City Star, where I also reviewed rock music. For my master's project at the University of Missouri School of Journalism, I reported throughout the Middle East during the Iranian Revolution in 1979. As a reporter at my hometown paper in Wilmington, I wrote about a notorious motorcycle gang. I celebrated Thanksgiving with lifers in a state prison. I interviewed the aging bluegrass pioneer, Bill Monroe on his tour bus. I covered the Ku Klux Klan. I had a column about City Hall. In 1982, I was hired by the Philadelphia Inquirer to cover cops at night from a dingy press room in the police administration building. Later that year, my mother died suddenly and unexpectedly after heart surgery. And my mother's words that had been in the back of my mind were now ringing in my ears. One day you will write my story. So I proposed to write about my mother for the Inquirer's Sunday Magazine and the editors agreed. In fact, they said, why don't you do it for Mother's Day? Next slide, please, Jeffrey. The resulting cover story on Mother's Day, 1983, five months after her death, was the first English language presentation of the Lviv sewer rescue, and also one of the first articles written about a Holocaust survivor by the survivor's child. It was titled, A Bird in the Wind, a play on my mother's maiden name and her original Polish first name, Fija, and her Hebrew name, Sipora, both of which mean little bird. This article generated such a strong response from readers that the inquirer soon sent me on a month long trip with my father to re revisit all the places of his past. Next slide, please, Jeffrey. We traveled to Rivna, my father's birthplace in what had become the Soviet Union, to Lille, the French city where he'd been arrested by the Gestapo, 
to Auschwitz in what had become Soviet-occupied Poland and to Buchenwald in what had become East Germany. The resulting cover story, Journey to My Father's Holocaust, was published on April 21st, 1985, coinciding with an American gathering of Jewish Holocaust survivors convention in Philadelphia. I won a few awards for this piece, but the best part for me was seeing how proud it made my father. While my mother had been so prominent as a speaker, my father had been content to remain in the background, but now he was getting invitations to speak about his experiences and he was accepting them. Next slide, please, Jeffrey. Now I myself had become inextricably identified in the public mind with the Holocaust. I reviewed Mouse in the Wall Street Journal. Chaim Potok had me over to his house for dinner. Ellie Wiesel called me at home to encourage my writing. I got a standing ovation from the American gathering of Jewish Holocaust survivors in the grand ballroom of the Waldorf Astoria in New York for a spoken letter to my mother. And in 1992, after the Soviet Union collapsed, the Inquirer sent my wife and me to my mother's hometown in the Carpathian Mountains, a town that had been closed to Westerners, but was now accessible in newly independent Ukraine. And so I produced the third cover story in my magazine trilogy about my parents. Next slide, please, Jeffrey. This piece appeared simultaneously with a half hour PBS documentary about my trip to Turka, based on the 15 hours of video we shot there. The documentary, Visiting the Past, was produced and directed by Janine Jacquet Biden, the former sister-in-law of our current president. Some of the raw video also was used by a Ukrainian film crew in the production of another documentary about Turka, titled Wordless, which was released earlier this year. Both films can be seen on YouTube and on my website. My mother sometimes spoke of notebooks she had kept in the sewer in which she wrote poetry and prose during those 14 months in hiding. Notebooks she had brought with her to America. Her sewer notebooks had been lost in the process of creating a new life, meeting and marrying George, raising two children, and teaching two generations of Jewish students in Delaware. But my uncle Leon gave me a shoebox full of letters my mother wrote to him in 1945 and 46 to let him know she had survived. A shoebox containing 120 letters in Polish. For me, this was a treasure trove. In 1989, I befriended the Warsaw filmmaker Maciek Pawlitsky when he was at the Inquirer on a fellowship. And he and his wife, the Warsaw TV personality Magdalena Pawlitska, graciously gave of their time to translate my mother's post-war letters. We spent countless days with these letters in the tiny kitchen of my Philadelphia row house as Helena's story gradually came to life. They also translated other materials, including a letter I received from the sewer worker, Stefan Vorblewski, shortly before his death. Next slide, please, Jeffrey. And then 26 years later, in August, 2015, I was in the final stage of cleaning out my childhood home in Wilmington to prepare it for sale, rummaging through a cardboard box that once held Xerox paper, when I found what I'd been looking for all my adult life. Next slide, please, Jeffrey. 
as I removed my mother's sewer notebooks from this box and held them in my trembling hands, I saw my mother's handwriting from that filthy underground hideout seven decades earlier, 167 pages jam-packed with the contemporaneous thoughts of a young Jewish woman hiding from the destruction of her world. Next slide, please, Jeff. For the last seven years, and most intensively for the last few months, I've been working with my longtime Polish translator, Bozena Benar Slavov of Philadelphia. And technology has enabled us to work side by side to bring this material to the public soon. Next slide, please, Jeffrey. One day, you will write my story. Yes, it has been more than 60 years, but I feel good that the day is fast approaching. I feel good that I found my mother's sewer writings seven years ago, and that technology has enabled me to create a website dedicated to my parents and a monthly newsletter now received by more than 1,500 people all over the world. Technology enabled me to tweet a photo of my father's arm with his Auschwitz number this past Father's Day that went viral surprisingly, surprisingly with almost 7,000 likes and more than 700 retweets. You can find it on Twitter. Thank you all for your time today. I invite you to sign up for my mailing list to receive my free monthly newsletter. Just go to my website, davidleepreston.com, where you'll find a box at the bottom of the homepage to add your email address. You'll get an email asking you to confirm your free subscription. I welcome you to join me on my journey, but don't go anywhere yet because Lucy Adlington is coming up soon to talk about her terrific new book, Shalom from Philadelphia. Well, thank you very much, David. What an amazing presentation. It's, it has exceeded even my expectations. So thank you so, so much. And I'm sure there'll be many questions for you in the um, Q&A, which will follow. I wanna take a little bit of break. So we have a reflective space to um, before we get to Lucy. So I'm gonna share my screen again. And I'm about to play another song from Lenka. Ah, 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 ah,
Okay, very nice, Lenka. And we're going to be moving now to uh, introduce our last speaker, uh, Lucy Adlington from the UK. And let me tell you a little bit about Lucy. Lucy is a British historian and writer with more than 20 years with a specialization in social history. Lucy, Lucy is the author of seven historical novels and five nonfiction books. Her recent narrative, the history, the dressmakers of Auschwitz is now an international bestseller. Lucy also runs the history wardrobe series of costume presentations and has an extensive collection of vintage and antique clothing. The book she will be talking about is the dressmakers of Auschwitz, the book. Um, and there are some links that will be put into um, the, the chat so you can follow up. So welcome Lucy and unmute yourself and um, we'll see you soon on screen. Hello, I think I'm unmuted. I think I'm good. Okay, and we see you. So take it away, Lucy. It's a pleasure Hi. to have you with us. And what a very moving musical introduction to speak. That, that was absolutely amazing. And I think overall, I mean, you've done some great programming tonight because we've seen this progression from hearing Ben speak so movingly about his personal experiences and then David speaking about his parents and how he was able to share their stories and is continuing to do so. And now I suppose I'm, I'm the third part of that, of that series and that I'm a generation who is sharing stories that have gone before without a personal connection. And I want to say, David, that I was incredibly moved to listen to your account. And I had, I had no idea of Helena's story, actually. So I look forward to finding out more. And what struck me is that I knew 
of the group of people who survived in the sewers of Lviv through a garment, through a woolen sweater. A little girl who was in the sewers and saved in the same way, Christina, when she went into the sewers, she was wearing a green sweater that her grandmother had knitted. And she was still wearing it when she escaped from the sewers when the town was liberated. And now this sweater is in the uh, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And in my collection, I have a replica of this garment, this little green sweater that's been reverse engineered from the original. And so that story touched me particularly. And for me, as a, as a historian, I often use clothes, clothes are my speciality, to make those connections. And so, yes, that little sweater that really helped me make a connection with, with the story of David's mother there. And you might be thinking, well, clothes, you know, they're so frivolous. Oh, isn't that just fashion? But I've been a clothes historian for over 20 years now, and I find that clothes are incredibly powerful in the way they can tell stories and the way they can hold memories. If you have any garments that belong to loved ones, you know, who've now passed, then you might have that sense of connection with them. So many years ago, I think it was back in 2008, I first saw reference to something clothing related. It was reference to a fashion salon. And I don't mean a fashion salon in Paris or London or New York, a fashion salon in Auschwitz which is the most grotesque association, isn't it? How could you possibly think that there would be a fashion salon in a place synonymous with, with horror, with brutality? It's an extermination center that auschwitz birkenau complex. And at the time I wasn't able to find out more, but it certainly stuck in my mind. And uh, I'm doing the short version of the story here, but through a series of, I would say small miracles, a lot of serendipity. I was able to find out the identity of some of the dressmakers who'd worked in this fashion salon. And to give you a little bit more background, the fashion salon was established at Auschwitz I main camp, just uh, not far, not very far in fact, from the, the infamous Arbeit Machtfrei gate. And the salon was established by none other than the commandant's wife, Hedwig Huss. And I'm going to get to how this came about, but just trying to understand how could you have something that celebrates beauty and skill and creativity in a place that's designed to enslave people and to exterminate them. So, as I said, through a series of very serendipitous connections, and I think this story is very much about connections, I was in touch with the families of survivors. And they were able to share family photographs with me, share some testimonies, documents, clothing items, all manner of things. And they also introduced me to the last surviving seamstress of this fashion salon in Auschwitz, a Slovakian woman called Bracha Kohut. Well, she was born Bracha Berkovic. And if you can see behind me, I've got a selection of photographs here, and these are reprinted in the book. And here is Bracha and her sister Katka. Katka was training as a tailor. But the woman responsible for running the fashion salon in Auschwitz is Marta, Marta Fuchs. So I'm going to, I can't tell you very much in half an hour about all of these women, but essentially there came to be a core of 25 mainly Jewish prisoners working in the fashion salon, although ultimately from my research I think at least 40 women and girls passed through this salon. And this it was an extraordinary experience for them to be lifted out of the hard labour in Birkenau, in, in Auschwitz. So we have Bratka, Bracha and Katka and Marta, and here this is Hunya. And just to give you a closer idea of Hunya, there she is before the war in the 1930s. So Hunya was born in Kezmarok in Czechoslovakia, 
But unlike many of the other women who stayed in their home, uh, in fact, many of these women, young women from Bratislava, although Marta opened a, uh, a salon herself. So Hunya decided that she, she thought Kejmarok was too small a town for her dressmaking talents. She'd apprenticed with a local dressmaker and she wanted to spread her wings. So she traveled to Leipzig in Germany. And following Hunya's story was really, it was a way of following the rise of persecution against Jewish people in Germany. And I could see from her memoirs what it was like to be living as a Jewish person in Leipzig. And to all intents and purpose, purposes, she was very successful. She fell in love, she got married, she ran her own salon, and she dressed the elite of Leipzig. She dressed Jews and non-Jews. They all wanted Hunya's designs. She had quite a design flair about her. But Hunya was aware of growing restrictions and growing brutality. She experienced Kristallnacht in 1938. And eventually all roads led these women to one place, to Auschwitz-Birkenau. But before I give you an insight into some of their experiences there, I wanted to just give you a bit of background about why clothing is so important to this history, to this narrative. Because the Nazis were well aware of how powerful image was in their regime. Of course, you'll all have heard of Josef Goebbels, the Minister of Propaganda. He knew all about the power of moving images, the spoken word and still images. And so when I was writing the book, I looked at a lot of primary sources, so documents and so on. And some of these included women's magazines. And it's very clear if I can show you some from my archive, that image was powerful. So here from 1938 is an edition of Frauenwarte. It's a national socialist women's magazine. And yes, it has lots of adverts for fashions and recipes and childcare, but look at the image on the front that stalwart, emotionless, almost robotic male military figure. That's very much the ethos in Germany by 1939, very, very military based. Conversely, in women's magazines, although there are many art articles on how to be a good Nazi woman, fashion still predominates. And this is Die Mode fashion magazine, the fashion a very popular magazine and this one is actually from November 1942. By the time this magazine was published the fashion salon in Auschwitz was open and the clients could come and flick through magazines such as these browsing the latest fashions, German fashions of course not foreign fashions, and they could pick up ideas which they would then tell the Jewish and slave laborers in the fashion salon to make. And what a disconnect. On the one hand, beautiful fashions, lovely fabrics. On the other hand, people plucked from the very doors of the gas chambers to sew. So how, how did the, the, the women get there? Well, first, I want to talk a little bit more about the fashion industry in Germany, which the Nazis very quickly made connections with because the fashion and textile industry is worth a lot of money to the economy then and now. It's a hugely powerful industry, never be fooled by the glamour of fashion. It is about money and hard work. And so much of the money and hard work was being provided by Jewish capital and Jewish labor for many reasons, which I touch on in the book, uh, Jewish people have long been associated with not only the industrial side of textiles, but also the artisan skills, the sewing, the cutting, and so on. And also with the selling, the retail of fashions. The greatest department stores in Germany were owned and run by Jewish people. And so were many of the boutiques and millinery shops and little tailoring workshops and so on. The Nazis decided they wanted this industry because of its profit. And so through a series of bullying and outright theft, they Aryanized, that is they took over these businesses and rendered them Judenfrei, Jew free. And so fashion then takes on an incredibly sinister 
aspect. And I'll show you now a dress from my collection, which if you can see, it's a very, very pretty apple green floral crepe dress. And you might think, oh, well, that's nice. What does it have to do with Holocaust history? Well, this dress it dates from 1939. We can date it through the styling and so on. And it has a very disturbing label. And if I show you the label, I hope you can read it. There's an acronym here, A-D-E-F-A, -E ADEFA. ADEFA was established just a few weeks after Hitler came to power in 1933. It was a consortium of German businessmen who wanted to get their hands on the Jewish textile businesses. ADEFA in English means German Aryan Federation of Textile and Clothing Manufacturers. German Aryan. That made up concept essentially meaning not Jewish. And ADEFA promoted their fashions under the guise of being completely Jew free. They said that no Jewish hands had contaminated these garments. I'm using their words. The Nazi propaganda spoke a lot about contamination and uh, poisoning of German people by Jewish fashion workers. And so consumers really, they played their own small part in the rise of persecution or the the continuing expansion of persecution against Jews in Germany because they could go into a shop and say they wanted a defer garments. They didn't want to buy from Jews. And this fitted in with the Nazi policies, don't buy from Jews. And the intimidation by brown shirts standing out sh outside shops. And this all led into the violence against Jewish shop owners, business owners, and so on. And so, Adefa promoted their fashions, glorifying in the, back, in the fact that they were rendering the fashion trade Jew free. And I recently acquired another very innocent looking object, this time menswear, and it's a black wool tie from the 1930s. And it just looks like your regular tie, but inside it has its own piece of anti-Semitic history. And perhaps you can see faintly imprinted, there is the Adefa logo again. So an Adefa tie. So I've written about all of this in the book. I thought it was really important to try and set up the context of how you could have a fashion salon in Auschwitz. It didn't just happen by accident. It happened because greedy people made choices along the way that they wanted something. In the case of the Nazis, they wanted to take over businesses. They wanted to control things for themselves. They wanted to feel that racial supremacy. And this was no different for the wife of the commandant of Auschwitz, Hedwig Huss. Hedwig had lived with her family at Dachau and then Sachsenhausen and then in Auschwitz. And she knew all about the idea of appropriation, taking something for herself. Her house was stolen from a Jewish, uh, sorry, a Polish Christian family. Everything in it was stolen from goods, plundered from Polish people in occupied Poland. And her clothes, her clothes came from the suitcases of deportees to Auschwitz who were murdered on the whole on arrival. Her clothes came from Jewish enslaved laborers who were kept alive for just that little bit longer so that she could have elegant gowns. And she preferred the Jewish laborers because when she hired seamstresses from the, the town of Oswiecim, Christian Poles, she had to pay them. Hedwig didn't want to pay. And so in 1942, when the first official Jewish transports arrived in Auschwitz, they were trainloads of women from Slovakia. And recently, there's been so much more research about these women. It's wonderful to see that their voices are being heard and their stories are being shared. And on these transports were the, so the, the young dressmakers that I've featured in my book, including Marta Hooks, a very talented cutter. And Marta ended up working as a sort of 
I don't know, general help in the Huss household, in this beautiful villa, villa. It was paradise, Hedvig said. And Marta looked after the commandant's children. But one day Hedvig mentioned that she had some fur that needed restyling. And Marta said, I can do that. Now, she didn't say this, of course, because she wanted to help Hedvig. Hed was, was the despised SS. She said it because getting any kind of safe employment was better than working in quarries and construction sites in Birkenau and even building the gas chambers as some of the other young Slovakian women were. And so Marta went up into the attic of the commandant's house and she was very canny. Oh, perhaps you don't know that word, canny. Is that a bit of a British word? She was clever in a, in a very good way. And she immediately said that she needed help. And so in this way, she brought another woman in, Berta. And they said, no, they needed, they needed more help than that. And Berta was able to bring in Rojica, her 14-year-old uh, niece. And so, okay, three, three people now saved sewing in Hedvig's attic. And the clothes they made were so beautiful and so stylish that other SS wives who were living in the town, they got jealous and they said they wanted fashions too. And that's why Hedvig set up a fashion salon and it was set up in the SS administration building. I have, this is a wartime picture of the building. You can see it's a white building and the forecourt is being used there for uh, a military roll call. And here is the building now, it still stands. You can see it if you're visiting Auschwitz main camp. It was called the Stabsgebäude, the SS admin block. And the line of windows at the bottom is the upper basement. And it was in one of these areas that the fashion salon was opened with a cutting and sewing room and a fitting room. And here, a mere 10 minutes walk from the Commandant's house, the SS wives and some SS guards came to have their clothes fitted. They came to browse the fashion magazines to have these young women sew for them. Now I'd mentioned Hunya in Leipzig. Hunya came a little later than the other Slovakian women. She was on the last train from Leipzig. And I recently read a study of this, this last train of Jewish people from Leipzig, and it said in the study, there were no known survivors. Well, I beg to differ. Because when this train arrived in Auschwitz and the doors of the cattle car were opened, Hunya was traveling with a husband and wife. Uh, Hunya's own uh, husband was already in the concentration camp system and did not survive. But this husband and wife team were together and the husband turned to the wife, Ruth, and said, stick with Hunya. I have a feeling she'll make it. And he was right. Hunya had such a strong spirit. She was defiant from the get-go and she needed her spirit because as you'll all know, I'm sure, the arrival in the concentration camp system meant having your clothes stripped from you, having your safety taken away, everything familiar. And I think that's incredibly interesting to consider then the meaning of clothes at that situation, that your clothes are so personal, aren't they? They might be something that you've made or a loved one has made for you, or that you've been on a shopping trip on the Corso in Bratislava or wherever you are. Or there might be something that hold memories. It might be something that you've chosen with particular care for this journey to this unknown place in the East. And clothes, as well as showing our memory, our, our individuality and holding our memories, they also give us dignity. We don't want to be in public naked. And yet all of these new arrivals were stripped in public very brutally, their clothes taken. And that was a deliberate Nazi policy. They knew the power of clothes. They knew that if the SS guards were there with their immaculate designer uniforms, they were warm, they were smart, they looked superior. They knew it would be a visual contrast to these poor prisoners, brutalized and naked, and then put either into the humiliating striped camp uniforms or into a hodgepodge of civilian clothes 
in the case of these Slovakian women, into uniforms taken from Russian POWs who'd already been murdered. They were crusted with blood and feces and they had bullet holes in. So these clothes were symbolic of the world that the Jewish prisoners had arrived in. But as the husband said to his wife, leaving the cattle car, stick with Hunya, I have a feeling she'll make it. Hunya was one of the lucky few. Although there were many, many dressmakers and tailors throughout the concentration camp system, if you didn't have luck, you were nowhere. And the luck for these young women was having connections. And I don't mean schmoozy connections. I mean connections of family and friendship, loving connections. When Hunya arrived, she'd already been familiar with forced labor. She'd been working in a fur factory in Leipzig because the Germans, having rendered the textile trade due free, then found they'd run out of talent and labor, which is why they then exploited labor in thousands of sites across the Reich, including in many ghettos. And uh, this is something that I think is really important. So I, I've written about it in the book, this sense that there were no labels on the items produced in the ghettos in these forced, uh, forced labor factories. There were no labels saying made by Jews. Oh no, that was all secret. And so Hunyu, in, uh, after a very, very difficult bout of illness, she was selected, her number was called, and she was terrified. When your number's called, what does that mean? Nothing good in Birkenau. But she was selected for a sewing audition, which she passed because she was a brilliant sewer. And she found herself in the SS admin building, the Stabsgebäude, and she found herself with these lovely young women in a fashion salon. And they welcomed her. And they said, here, you can wear clean clothes. You can wash. We have beds. We have to share them with the night shift and the day shift, but we have beds. And here the women could work not at brutal, hard labor, industrial labor, but here they could work at something they knew and loved, something that gave them pride. They could work with clothes. Yes, they were sewing for the SS, but I can tell you, after interviewing Bracha, his Bracha, she didn't even think about them. You know, I asked her, what was it like sewing for the SS? What was it like sewing for Hedwig Huss? And she just shrugged and said, mm, her figure wasn't so good. She'd had four children. So she didn't even consider the SS. And ironically, and horrifically, I think, the SS did not consider their Jewish dressmakers. From so many interactions, which I've, I've detailed in the book, here's the book, it's very clear that the SS, even though they were working in this really intimate situation, you know, there was Marta with the tape measure measuring these SS women. There were SS officers picking up the fashions every Saturday, ready for their glamorous SS entertainments in the camp on Saturday nights. Music provided by prisoners, food cooked by prisoners. Even in that intimate situation, the SS did not see these talented women as people. And in fact, Bracha's sister here, Katka, said, we were not people to them. We were dogs and they were the masters. Now, there are so many stories I could tell you, but I know, I know um, we want to move on to questions soon. But it is heartening for me to know that the connections these young women made helped keep them at least mentally and emotionally robust. They still were on the terrible Auschwitz rations, supplemented every once in a while by a bit of bread given them by a client, maybe a square of chocolate. So mentally and emotionally, their friendships were hugely important. And Hunya said, we became like a family, united in sorrow and joy. But even more astonishing, they weren't content with saving themselves. One of the dressmakers said, everything we could get our hands on, we stole it and we gave it to other prisoners. Now, when I say stole, I should use the camp slang organize because essentially the SS were always stealing from prisoners in Auschwitz and from deportees who were murdered when they were arrived. 
Many of the young women had had their time working in the vast plunder warehouses of Auschwitz called Canada. And here there's another element of clothing you, you can read about in the book, uh, very, very powerful stories there. And so the SS took what they wanted, as did the commandant's wife, Hedvig Huss. She even took underwear from these plunder warehouses and so on. So when I say that the young prisoners stole things, I mean they organized them. And they became a, a network, part of a network of resistance in the camp. In fact, the incredible Marta, who was capo, was the leader of this uh, work commando, the fashion salon. She was a member of the Auschwitz underground. And she was actually uh, sl slotted in to escape if Rudolf Werber and Alfred Wetzler's escape attempt to warn Hungarian Jews in 1944 had not been successful. And as we know, it was successful. Rudy and Freddie got out, but Marta had been slated to go next because she'd been born in Hungary and they all wanted to tell the world what was happening. Marta was able to smuggle messages out of the camp through her contact. It really is an astonishing story, all under the noses of the SS who had no idea. They were just coming in for their beautiful gowns and their little children's clothes for their families. Marta did eventually escape with some of the survivors. And during this escape attempt, they were all shot by Germans and Marta was shot in the back. She survived. And if you want to know what happened to her, you have to read the book. <laughs> she survived. Well, or you can just ask me, I'll tell you. And, um, but, Several of the dressmakers did not. And so after the war, when the women were eventually liberated, having experienced both the death marches, time in Ravensbrück, and then in a terrible labor camp called Malhof, and then the return home, and then the incredibly dispiriting attempt to come back to normal and their hometowns where of course nothing was normal. Their families had mainly been murdered. The towns were not necessarily welcoming of Jewish people coming back and wanting their things back, but they they had to rebuild their lives. And one of the things that Hunya says, Hunya survived. I think I've given that away now. Hunya said what was that she gave her testimony after the war so that names of those who'd been shot and killed would not be forgotten. They were Lulu, Lulu Grunberg, Baba Teichner, and Borishka Zobel, amongst others. And sadly, of all these women, the ones who were shot and killed escaping are the ones I've not yet been able to find full biographies for. So my work is continuing. And it has been, for me, an incredibly privileged, I suppose, and very moving experience as a historian, always to remember that when historians are looking at documents or photographs and so on, we're looking at the lives and fates of real people. And I, I, I felt very, uh, very entwined with these stories and also very, very grateful for the families of survivors who let me into their lives and let me share the stories of their loved ones. And when I originally said, you know, to my agent, I want to write this history book about the dressmakers of Auschwitz. Do you think there'll be any interest? She said, yeah, I think, I think she knew. And I, was astonished. I was able to tell Bracha, uh, the last surviving seamstress, I went to interview her in San Francisco while visiting uh, an extremely uh, helpful archive at the Holocaust Library in San Francisco. And I said to Bracha, I said, you know, I think a lot of people are going to read your story. Now, sadly, Bracha died. She died of COVID uh, not too long after the interview. So I'm, I'm so pleased. I am so pleased that we had a week together to speak. And I say speak, I listened. Bracha had so much to say. What a privilege to listen to her. But the book, um, the book came out um, and, and went on the New York Times bestseller list and stayed there for six months, which means for me, the joy of knowing that these women, their names will not be forgotten and their lives will not be forgotten. And I also feel that it's really important um, to, to be aware, of course, as you will all know, there are so many voices, there are so many stories still to be told and so many aspects of Holocaust history, um, whether it's a personal story from your family or whether it's you know, an entirely different scenario, they all deserve an audience. 
And now I can tell you that the book uh, is to be published in 22 different languages. And I'm really pleased as well that it's going to be published in Hebrew in Israel, where many of the survivors ended up. And the, of those who survived, there's Hunya, the redoubtable Hunya. And so I'll show you the last item today as I speak. Normally I speak for three weeks in a go without breathing, but I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going to show you this suit here. And this suit is the most precious thing in my collection. And I have a collection dating back to the 17th century of textiles and garments, and they've all got stories. But this is my favorite. It's a very smart, silky suit from the 1950s. And it was made by Hunya in Tel Aviv in her little apartment near the beach. And I went to visit it when I had the opportunity to go to Israel and to visit Yad Vashem and, and, and interview people and so on. And Hunya made this, she carried on sewing after the war and she, she made this for her niece, Gila. And while Hunya was sewing, she was sewing for exclusive ladies' establishments in Tel Aviv. As Hunya was sewing, Gila, her niece, was writing. And Gila wrote Hunya's memoirs. So though, alas, Hunya was no longer alive when I came to research this book, I had the memoirs that Hunya so beautifully collected, even as a teenager. And then I had this garment, a testimony not only to Hunya's skill, which is beautiful, but also to her love, because she made this garment with love. She did not make it as a slave laborer in a death camp for the commandant's wife. So through the book, you'll find out more about these women, more about the, 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 the links between the Nazis and the fashion trade, and you'll find out what happened to survivors, because of course, it, it's so important to know how do people keep on living post-war? How do they adapt? But overwhelmingly, of the testimonies that I read or watched, and after speaking to Bracha, the last survivor of the Salon, they all said it's so important to share the stories. So I'm very pleased to have had this opportunity to meet you all today, and not only to listen to Ben and David, but to share the stories of these young Slovakian women. And if you'd like to find out more or contact me, I think Jeffrey is going to put my, my email details in. And I have a website, lucyadlington.com. The book is available. Um, to buy in paperback and hardback in many languages now. I've just been doing lots of interviews in Uruguay and Mexico and so on. And um, so you can, you can buy the book or get it from a library. Um, but, or, or just take away these memories today, these memories of young women who are not forgotten. Thank you so much for, for letting me share a little bit of their stories today. Well, thank you, Lucy. It was beautiful. Absolutely amazing story. And your book is uh, also terrific. I, I want to, are you sharing the screen or? Cause all this it's stuff. nothing to do with me. My oh, okay. Hands are here. <laughs> okay well, all right. Very good. Let me figure out what's going on here. Uh, I, I'm on my cell phone. I can't see a thing. Okay. That's no problem. Uh, give me a second. You're sharing your screen. I don't think so. No. Well, obviously, yeah. Uh, oh, it's Jeanette Neiman. Yeah, can you stop sh uh, sharing screen, please, Jeanette? Well, you can stop her if you're the host. Yep, yeah, yeah. I'm going to do that right now. Uh, da -da -da. I would like to ask something, may I? Yes, I'm gonna, let me just wait a second. I'm, I'm glad we're back. So I am going to change the view into gallery view. I'm going to open up our discussion in our Q&A. We go as long as we organically need to and we get all the questions and answers. We and have, may I, we have may I, while you're just, um, doing your wonderful um, organization, can I just say that I'm working on a, a follow on book and Please. love to hear from people. I'm writing about child um, survivors and child refugees now. And again, linking through objects that hold memories and so on. So um, finding the work, you know, one thing always leads to another, doesn't it? One connection always leads to many, many more. Thanks. Yes, I just want to 
That's great. And why don't you put your information in chat um, while we're I, talking? I can do oh, can you? Yep. Okay. So right. be you right. free, <laughs> okay. And um, okay. So anybody now, I want to just propose that you go to the reactions button, like I am about to do, and raise your hand. I see that uh, Makayla has your hand raised. So please, Makayla, you can take the first question and present it to whoever you'd like. I would like to know what was the name of the commander who uh, hired the young ladies from Slovakia? That's the first question because there were more commanders in Auschwitz. And the yeah. second question, what was the maiden name of Marta? Thank you. You're welcome. So Marta is Fuchs. She was born in what was then Hungary and moved to Slovakia. After the war, she married and became Minarik. So that was her married name. Marta Fuchs is her maiden name. The commandant um, I'm speaking of is the first and longest serving commandant of Auschwitz, Rudolf Huss, mm -hmm. who um, it, it was his wife Hedwig who established the salon. And Hedwig Huss was in Auschwitz from 1940 to 1944. And she stayed there even when other commandants came and, and took over from Rudolf Huss. And interestingly, Rudolf Huss, when he had been captured, and I do describe this in the book, uh, how Hedwig was found after the war. When Rudolf Huss was after his trial, the night before his execution in Auschwitz main camp, Rudolf Huss was put into the upper basement of the SS admin block, the same basement that had housed the dressmakers. And that was his last night on earth. So it was Rudolf Huss. And this is Marta Fuchs or Fuchsova, F-U-C-H. And she became Minarik. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And David, do you have a question? Your hand is raised, so you can unmute yourself and ask, please. Okay. Uh, hi, Lucy. Uh, what a what a wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, did you, in your research, uh, run across the firm Schwartz and Company? In, yes. In in Lvov. Yes. They, yes. Uh, a very very prominent tailoring company. Yes. They, yes. So they employed my mother uh, uh, before the liquidation of the ghetto and before she ended up. Uh, fleeing into the sewers. Uh, she was working for this uh, textile company. My understanding was that they were employed to essentially clean and refurbish Jewish clothing and then send it to German families or to uh, perhaps the front, I really don't know. But um, uh, I think uh, this company also was uh, subjected to uh, a uh, a pretty large uh, action just prior to the liquidation of the ghetto in which an, uh, a number of women and children were, were murdered. But in any case, my mother did work there under an assumed name. Uh, she was still using the name Halina, but she was using a different last name. And uh, um, I have her, her, her Arbeits Ausweis from this period. Um. So, uh, well, you and I will have to be in touch because one aspect that I'm working on with the new book is is the recycling and re refurbishment of clothes. And yes, there was a there were very strong punishments if any Jewish clothes arrived, usually from murdered deportees that were then um, taken to, to centers, but also clothing that had been stolen locally in the ghettos. There was a very severe punishment for any evidence of previous Jewish owners left on the clothes. So whether yellow threads left from sewing the stars on or anything like that, I think it would certainly be interesting to know more. And that Arbeitskart, that is her ticket to life, isn't it? Because yeah. it meant some bread. And there's so much work already been done understanding that the tailoring businesses were lifesavers, at least temporarily for as long as they could be and many people who couldn't even sew you know they'd never been in their tailoring shears in their life they would they were brought in you know just say you can sew a little so that their lives could be you know they could be relatively safe for a little longer so that that is fascinating to know thank you for sharing 
I want to kind of follow up both David's and Lucy's. The movie In Darkness had a sequel. And at the very end, the woman who was in Israel, who was also in the Lvov, um, who had the red sweater, and that I think you spoke about originally. Christina, uh, Christina Chiga, green sweater. I've got to be precise green sweater. then. <laughs> okay, green sweater. I'm sorry. But she came, she came to the um, debut of the film and, on, and came up at the end of the film. You may have seen that film. If not, I would highly recommend it. It's on Amazon. Um, and um, you can look up on Aneshka Holland. I, I know Holland's film, yeah. Yeah, so um, you'll see this, you'll see the, you'll see the sequel of what she, she had an interview with this woman uh, from Israel. And then eventually she brought this woman uh, up in front of the debut. It was a, a very emotional uh, part of the movie. So I wanted to bring you in. I recommend all of you uh, see not only In Darkness, which was the uh, story mm. that David was um, talking about, but also the sequel to In Darkness um, was, is quite Hoffman. Avi Hoffman, it's a pleasure to meet you. I uh, see your hand is raised and I welcome you to the program. I welcome you to our group. And please, those of you who don't know Avi, tell us a little bit about yourself so we can welcome you. Oh, um, well, thank you, first of all, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to finally meet you. I've heard so much about you. Um, I don't know how many here in the group uh, know my work, but I'm a child of Holocaust survivors. Uh, I'm also a, uh, an actor and, and producer. And my mother uh, and I, founded a Jewish cultural organization called Why I Love Jewish dot O-R-G. Uh, so you're all welcome to join. There are several people here in the group that I do know, um, and I'm very excited to see them. And I congratulate you on an, on an amazing day. I, I didn't know what to expect. So three great speakers. Um, I actually want to ask a question about the DP camps and David and Lucy, both of you. Um, I am, I've done a lot of work in Holocaust education and awareness, um, but one of the areas that I feel has been slightly neglected, and I now have a, a, an archive that I'm working on uh, that deals extensively with the period immediately following the war from 1945 until 1950 in the DP camps. And, and um, it turns out my grandfather was the chief of police at the Hindenburg Kaserna uh, camp in Ulm, and he brought with him an album. One of the things, Lucy, that I think you'll find interesting is that one of the main, they all had to make clothes for themselves. And so they created an entire tailor shop in the DP camp to make clothing. And I'm so, going around to your house because I'm just writing about this right now. DP camp occupational therapy and skills gaining, the clothing, the tailoring, the knitting. We're going to be best friends. Oh, I hope so. I, I hope so. I look forward to that very much. Um, and so, you know, I just was very curious whether you had any insights into the post-war period where all these survivors who, you know, thankfully had survived the camps and those who were escaping from the forests and the partisans, and they all kind of congregated into these, you know, thousands of, of camps. Um, my mother, who was professor of Yiddish at Columbia for 25 years, um, and a journalist as well, when she was nine years old, she kept a journal of all the songs that were sung in the DP camp. And so those two artifacts are now becoming a, a very big central part of, of a big research project, um, which will probably culminate in a Broadway musical. Um, in any event, uh, just curious, David, if you have any insight to the DP camps. And I do. I do. Please, anything you know, and sure. I'll, I'll put my email into um, the chat so we can communicate direct. Well, I can tell you uh, very briefly that my mother did uh, spend a brief period in a DP camp uh, in Prague called Lubetin, 
Uh, this was uh, August and September of 1946, um, after having survived uh, in the sewers in, in Lviv. And then uh, she remained in Prague and then ended up uh, going to Karlovy Vary, which is also known as Karlsbad, and ended up flying to uh, LaGuardia Airport uh, from Prague in, uh, in the beginning of 1947. So I don't know, I don't have too many uh, uh, details about her time uh, in, uh, in the DP camp in Prague. I do have a few bits of information which I'd be delight delighted to share with you. Uh, and uh, it's, it's nice, nice to be able to do that. Uh, C. Zelda, you're not, I can't hear you, but I know you're no. ready to jump through the screen. So not, now I am unmuted. May I have uh, one minute? Okay. You can have two. Take it. Two minutes. First of all, Lucy, I must tell you, I don't need to read the book. The way you presented it, it came alive. You are a wonderful presenter. Thank you. And of course, the story is unbelievable. We learn each, each day, we learn something new, what the Holocaust was all about. But I also want to tell you, Avi Hoffman, Avi Hoffman is a treasure to the Jewish people. He is a composer, an actor, a singer, a comedian on Broadway. He is the Mabeloshin. You don't know. If you want to appreciate Yiddish, you have to listen to Avi. I'm so glad to see you, Avi. You too. It's Zelda. a blessing. Thank you. Interesting enough to talk to Norman yesterday. So oh, really? <laughs> we're reconnecting. It's oh, much lovely. Lovely to see you. And, and what I'm learning is that this world that we live in is very, very close. It yes. is, and we're able to bring it together. We have multiple countries on Zoom here today. And it's really a mitzvah that we can do this with modern technology. Abe, you have a question. Oh, and may, sorry, before another question, um, I, I brief, briefly wanted to say something to Avi about the DP camps. Is that okay? We have time. We have plenty of time. This doesn't end until we finish talking. Are you kidding? Oh, I need a cup of tea. I'm English. I have to have a cup of tea every <laughs> Well, they will ever finish talking. <laughs> no, we, we, we should be in touch, I'm sure. But I, I just wanted to say that most of the um, women from Czechoslovakia um, that I've been writing about, they made their own way back. And so they weren't in the DP camps as such. But I'm very interested in the way that people pick up their lives after the war. And I know that one of the first things that these young women looked out for when they got back home was a sewing machine. Uh, Hunya also attempted to get back some of her family property as well with the mixed success. But in the DP camps, I've been trying to gather information about the ORT um, workshops designed to help people gain qualifications and skills and experience. And in particularly in, in Belson, because I suppose I'm looking at it through the British lens there, but hugely impressive how many Jewish educators, educators despite their own experiences of, of war and the genocide, and despite the shortages, how they were able to encourage people to take up talents or to um, enhance their talents. And this was not only to get work, which, which was essential, but also to get visas um, there's a very famous Taylor project that saved people through tailoring in Canada, but also just for self-esteem, the idea that you can reclothe yourself. So I've, I've researched quite a lot about what are called liberation clothes, the clothing that people choose to wear as opposed to what they were given by the Nazis. So I agree, there is so much more that we can all learn about the DP camps and that process of reintegrating, but carrying all that trauma with them. Thank oh. you. I wanted to also let you know, Lucy, my mother, who was a survivor of Auschwitz, came from Koshitze. And also, oh. and also uh, Ava Marimi, if you can raise your hand so everyone can see you. Ava has, her mother was a, an Auschwitz survivor and Ava has a tremendous book um, and uh, hidden recipes. And the story that Ava mother um, tells in her book is just amazing. And when I I, and Ava's become a very, very dear friend and I wanna call her out. So I'm sure there is a connection between Ava and you, Lucy, uh, that will have some common thread as well. Food is another extraordinary way of, of 
holding on to memories, isn't it? And that's, yes, that's something I've come across with, with uh, interviewing people. Wonderful, thank you. I yes. wanna, before I get to you, Avi, I have to get to some other people who are- Just yeah. one more thing. There are so many stories. One of the things, now that you're coming into this world, and I'm very happy to meet you, you know, you have Miriam Morris here in this group, and her story is beyond amazing because right. of her father. Right. So, Miriam, Avi, Miriam presented the group to the group. Oh, wonderful. Well, I'm, I'm sorry I missed it. but <laughs> I'll catch that on YouTube. It'll be on YouTube, Abby. You... Yes, it's on YouTube. Her program is on YouTube. You interview she was, her as well. She was so on our YouTube. So I'm sorry. Keep may, going. I, right. may, I, may I add about that? I have to that... stop because like, some people are anxiously waiting and they have a first crack. So Abe, go ahead. Oh, thank, thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, I totally agree with you, Abby, that um, the DP camp area has not been addressed in the history of the Holocaust. And uh, I started a group five years ago called the Families of the Felifing Displaced Persons Camp. And uh, my son and wife, uh, who my wife, uh, her parents were in the Bad Reichenhall DP camp. And I know uh, Isser uh, looks like uh, her family was from Bad Reichenhall. And we have two groups. And in May, um, 20 of us from mostly from the Feldefing uh, Facebook group went to Germany and visited both DP camps. And it was an amazing experience in the sense that the German people there, especially the community of Feldefing, welcomed, welcomed us. And they actually wanted us to come for years. Uh, well, in 2020, it was the 75th anniversary of Feldefing DP camp opening, and they wanted a group to come then, but we had the pandemic. So we were able to come in May. And um, I'd love to tell a story, Jeffrey. I know I'm your, on your list uh, of talking, but uh, I totally agree. There's so much more to talk about about the DP camp, because I see that as the beginning of life for Holocaust survivors and the beginning of life for people like me and others that lost grandparents and everybody else. So thank you, Avi, and uh, let's let's keep that story alive. Okay. And Jill, go ahead, you unmute yourself and you're next. Julia? You, can you make yourself louder? Okay, um, can you hear me? It's hard. It's hard. Um, is that better? Try it. Go ahead. Okay. Um, my question is for Lucy. Um, I was wondering if Hanya's um, post-war dress, if it has a label on the inside, if they, she was able to put a label on the back of it. Thank you. I... Did you hear that? Yes, I did. So you're asking you, if, you, the, you if the that? garment has a label inside it, which is a very pertinent question given the Adefa labels that were to emphasize not Jewish and then no labels in the camp. And to my knowledge, none of the clothes made in the fashion salon survive, but we wouldn't know because they had no labels, even though they were being sent to Berlin in some cases to, to the elite SS women in Berlin. But this garment does not have a label because Hunya made it, she basically upcycled it from a dress. She had a dress, um, you know, clothing was, in some cases it was still hard to come by in the 1950s in Israel, there was still a lot of austerity. So when Hunya's niece Gila needed a new outfit, Hunya converted one of her dresses into the suit and she wasn't making it to sell, so she didn't, she didn't put a label in it. And I think that's really, Poignant, isn't it? That that um, without the story of this dress, you would never know it. So it's so precious. But Hunya did after the war. She worked for a company established in Israel by Leah Gottlieb, Gotex Swimwear. And I deliberately bought a piece of Gotex Swimwear from this era, thinking, well, I don't know if Hunya made it, but she could have done. And it certainly makes me reflect a lot on, you know, it's worth remembering and respecting who makes our clothes, even though the label doesn't tell us. I hope that to answer your question. Okay, Zelda, you're up. Actually, 
it's not about tailoring. You were talking about the GP camps, and this is a most unusual fact. In Stuttgart, where I was at the age of 11, 12, and 13, we had a Jewish ballerina from Warsaw who was teaching us ballet at Beit Bialik's school. Mm -hmm. Now, this is something that was happening in GP camps just a couple of years after the war. Ruth, as a, as a sur child survivor, do you have any comments? You have to unmute yourself, Ruth. I'm absolutely fascinated by the stories, uh, especially about the dressmaking. My aunt was in Auschwitz and she also, uh, they knitted Angora, they had rabbits and they made Angora stuff. Oh and my goodness, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm barging in because I'm trying to find out about the Angora rabbit program in Auschwitz. So it would be amazing to be able to learn more. Her book is, uh, is Tapestry of Hope. Tapestry of Hope. Uh, by Alice Kern. And I'd be glad to send you a copy, dear. Uh, All right, I'd be glad to order one if it's available I'm, online. I'm going to look up your website. I, I wrote three books myself, but um, nothing like the drama that you told about. And not, no, I'm they're all important. Very anxious to read the book and find out more about this. And especially okay. because I, I, my aunt's story is, is fits into this. Her life was prolonged by the fact that she could knit. And oh. there, there was... <laughs> I'm sorry, I've just so, I've spent the entire day reading about this subject and then you're speaking to me and again it reminds me that these are people, you know, they're very dear people to you. And if Himmler, Heinrich Himmler hadn't had such an obsession with Angora, he wouldn't have started the rabbit program and it was a big part of the agricultural works in Auschwitz. Well, she was just a young girl so she didn't really understand the background or anything. She just wrote no. her memories of... Oh, I know the background, but I think having people to be able to share their memories is so important. She didn't have the resources to research any of this. This is long before we had computers. So uh, I think you'd find it interesting though, because it is a first person uh, from a teenage girl. And she, yeah. she was about 19 when she finally got out of there. Oh, to me, that's far more interesting than anything Himmler is doing. I don't care about Himmler. I want to know about, well, about her. The yeah. background, the background is, is important and how- I think I can do both, but I, as a historian, I can do background, but the most important thing is it's eyewitness, it's people, it's those who were there. The, the perpetrators have their part, but um, I think it's really, imp I think it's wonderful that, that this book is written, Tapestry of Hope. I will look forward to reading it. I gave her the title, so I feel like I'm part of the book, and I did. <laughs> I'll I, I wanted to bring you. <laughs> I wanted wanted to bring you in, Belima. I know you do a lot of research and work. I was wondering if you have a comment for us. Well, <laughs> I was just amazing. Where are you calling? Where, where, where are you zooming from? So we all know. Oh, I'm zooming from Brazil, from South Brazil, from a city called Curitiba. Okay, we share our life experiences here. David, I really, uh, I am very touched with your story because we have so many similarities going through life, right? And Lucy, your book is just amazing. There is a translation in Portuguese in your book, and it really makes me feel uh, speechless when I heard you talking the way you talk. You live your book, right? It gives you, you give life to your book. It's really, really amazing. I do quite a lot of research in different fields. I don't know if those people oh, here know. I am a researcher for Brazilians in the Holocaust. People never knew about it. There are plenty of South Americans killed in the Holocaust. There are plenty of South Americans 
and resistance groups. So I might be uh, publishing my book in Portuguese. Good. Yes, do it, do it. Quite soon. But I'm having a very difficult time in the publishing houses. This is not very easy, right? But I won't give up. It's just, just like your research is something completely unknown for the world, right? So we have to keep on going, researching. Every day we have something new coming up, right? And it, it means that it's not one story for the Holocaust. There are millions of stories and artifacts from the Holocaust. And we need to keep this light going on. I, uh, I want to respond. I will be happy to interview you for the Obligations of Memory podcast, and I will get your story started. So we'll, we'll connect. Now, Abby, now, Abby now, go ahead. Second. <laughs> Abby, go ahead. You have your hand raised. I was going to say, I'll happily be second, Lee Mali. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> Never give Thank up. you. Thank you. Memory <laughs> is important. I wish you so much for the best. Jeffrey, would it be possible for me to share my screen real quick? Surely. Like Go to ahead. Show Lucy something and the rest of you. Sure. Right. Oh, you have to allow me. So you have to allow screen sharing. Okay. We'll, we'll do. Hold on. Thank you. Lucy, I'm going to okay. show you four images. I'm getting excited. And I think they will be very exciting for you to see. Let me see if I can share. There you go. So this is image number one. Hi, Bold Schneiderei. The tailor shop workshop, yeah. It's the board of the tailor shop. Yeah. So that's yeah. one image. This is also the Bold Schneiderei. Men and women yeah. in the DP camp. This is the chairman of the board of the Schneiderei. His name was Landau. And, and this is the board of the Schneiderei of the tailor shop. And I'm guessing this is materials that they were using to make the clothing. It looks like a cutter's workshop. Yes, I believe so. I yeah, it's, my screen is really, really small. But yeah, they, they were able to take up to 16 layers of fabric. And they, when they had, I mean, it's such a skilled job. Fantastic. This is incredible. I need to know, and I won't take up all the time now, but I need to know more about the provenance of your album and your work. It just sounds fascinating. Give me your email. I will send you a link. Yeah, I've got yours, and Jeffrey is going to put my email up, aren't you, Jeffrey? Go on, Great. Jeffrey. Excellent. Wonderful. Great. Lucy Adlington at hotmail.com. That's me. I'm sorry, say it again. Lucy Adlington at hotmail.com. If you, there's my name. I got um, it. Yeah, just one D. You got it. I put it in the chat, but you're on your phone, so. It's hard. Yeah, it, it's amazing, isn't it? All these different connections. It's just, we're, we're all connected one way or another, aren't we? I wish people would emphasize connections more instead of divisiveness. Well, that's I mean, that's what it's all about, do. isn't it? Common humanity. That, that's what we're trying to do with our organization is to bring all the elements together under one umbrella. Yeah, yeah. And it's what Jeff is doing with these, these programs. I just published your email address. I have one question for you, um, Lucy. Since you're not Jewish, and since you're working in this pathway, what are some of the lessons you've learned about our religion? Oh, my goodness. Um, that's a big one. That is a big one. I think... I mean, people do ask, why, why are you writing this history? Because you're not Jewish. And to me, I, I'm always a little bit taken aback. Like, why, why wouldn't I want to be able to bring my skills or my background to this? Um, I think having been exposed as, at, a, at a young age to Holocaust stories, even as a child, that sense of injustice has stayed with me. And 
so I, I still feel that I still that this this should not have happened. None of this should have happened. We should not be able to be speaking about this today. It shouldn't have occurred. And I'm still trying to puzzle my way through that. And through all of the research over the last few decades, I suppose there are things that I pick out and get a sense of the interaction between secular and religious and, and even within religious, you know, different elements of orthodox life. But I've been very struck um, through research into Jewish history and Jewish friends at the importance placed on family, family loyalty and family love and the importance of community. And I know that's perhaps not specific to Jewish people, of course it isn't, but it really hit home interviewing Bracha who had given up her religion uh, while in Auschwitz and po in post-war Czechoslovakia, a socialist state, she very much hid her Jewish identity, but that what she always came back to was that sense of a Jewish upbringing, a Jewish home, the traditions, they were woven through her DNA and the love she had as she spoke of Shabbat or her mother breaking challah bread, all of that absolutely part of her identity which I, I hope I can honour as a non-Jewish person writing. Go ahead, Abby. Um, I, I, I'd love to speak to this non-Jewish element for just a moment, because I feel, you know, and I, I, I hope what I'm going to say is not controversial, but it, it might be. Um, having been in the world of Holocaust all my life, what I've learned is that the non-Jewish identity of the Holocaust is much, 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 much bigger than most people realize. I'm involved in a project called the Dachau Album. And because of the Dachau Album, I was invited to the Vatican to meet Pope Francis. Now he didn't invite me to the Vatican to meet him because I'm a nice Jewish boy from the Bronx. He invited me to meet him because in this album from the concentration camp in Dachau it are 30 pieces of original artwork that were created by a prisoner of Dachau who happened to be a Catholic. So we have to get away from this idea that this is only about Jewish people because there are so many stories that are not Jewish. And so, you know, why wouldn't Lucy want to know? This is a universe, and today we have, you know, genocide happening all over the world and in Ukraine. And we say never again, and yet never again is ever again, and never again is now. So, you know, the work we're doing is so very important. And, you know, we have to invite the non-Jewish world to share the world of the Jewish Holocaust, as well as the non-Jewish elements of the World War II experience. And that's what I have to say about it. So Jackie, I think that I was... is very powerful. That is very powerful. I think for the longest time, the Jewish aspects of camp life were neglected, and they were neglected on memorials. And I think since the 1970s, there has been a very strong move to to center Jewish people in their own genocide. I would say I also think it's it's really important. Yes, of course, we're going to honor everyone who was a victim of Nazi persecution and who is continuing to be a victim of genocide and discrimination now. But I think it's also important to remember that it is also the perpetrators and the bystanders who are, of course, mainly non-Jewish. And we really need to understand, you know, I, I often ask myself the question, what would I have done if I'd have been shopping in Berlin in the 1930s? Would I have fallen for the anti-Jewish propaganda? I hope not. Would I have resisted the Nazis by shopping in a Jewish shop, even though there were stormtroopers outside? So I think, yes, what Avi said is very powerful. We have to humanize it while not forgetting the very specific Jewish element of the Shoah. Yeah, and I want to just not to be defensive. Uh, the group opened a year ago. We have over 3,500 members worldwide. This, is a, this group is available to Jews and non-Jews, and we have many non-Jews in the group. But I have to also tell you how divisive Jew-on-Jew -Jew discussion 
is within our group and it is intolerable and I will have a zero tolerance policy for it. So I've been waiting for Jackie to raise her hand. She has raised her hand and I wanna introduce my good friend. Jackie is a child during the Holocaust from Tunisia um, and she has some projects. One of them is called We Are the Tree of Life, which is coming out in a film. So Jackie, I don't, I don't know what you're going to say, but I'm going to give you a plug. So go ahead, tell us uh, what you want to talk about. First of all, I want to say thank you to you, Jeffrey, for the magnificent work that you are doing and to everybody participating and to the presenters and, uh, and for the success that you are developing with that. I would like also to say thank you to Avi. Avi, I send you, uh, uh, yes, yes. And I will tell you why, because Jeffrey just mentioned we are the tree of life. You have expressed this last few, one minute or two, the real mission of we are the tree of life. And, uh, and I think that what you have expressed is the most important thing and the, the directions that we have to take today. Uh, congratulations on meeting the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> and congratulations on identifying why you have been able to meet with the Pope. That means we have 60 million people who died during World War II, 20 million of Soviets. We are teaching, we are developing curriculum, you are creating, we creating education. But uh, I have said that almost more or less last time, uh, when we had this, this per event is we have to figure out, we have to learn, we have to create how to take all this information and creating an impact on the people who have to learn about it, who have to understand about it, and who have to basically readjust their thinking and create, uh, I know we all have said that, but it comes from Elie Wiesel, how we can create a better world. You have mentioned Ukraine. And again, no politics, and I am not a politician, I don't understand anything about politics, but we have a humanitarian crisis. We have to take what we are doing. You, I, 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 why, why I love Jewish and we have to, 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 to take, we are the tree of life. I would say a few words about it. We have to take the word from Lucy and just readapt it, reformulate it to give some attention to what happened with the Jews and the non-Jews. I, I could talk too long. I know Jeffrey, Jeffrey, you should ask me to stop, but I'm going to just give a short definition of We Are the Tree of Life. Uh, it is an initiative that I developed two and a half years ago in San Diego, and it is giving um, a resurgence of all the performing arts, which has created by inmates in concentration camp, in DPs, in ghettos, anywhere. And how those inmates as survivors or are being exterminated have been able to give themselves some survival, give themselves a possibility to face the horrors that they were living by referring to their own skills, being a musician, being a poet, being a dancer, we talk about dancers. You know, uh, there is the mm, we we put all that together within a movie that we called Carry On, presented by We Are the Tree of Life. And uh, fortunately, I am uh, able to last year in two thousand and one to develop a number of programs at our Lawrence Family Jewish Community Center, and I'm doing it this year. And each program is related to one to dance, one to poetry, one to music. And in music, I am a little bit fighting, I have to say that. 
my team by saying, I want to present Olivier Messian. Olivier Messian, it's hard music. It's not Chopin. <laughs> okay. But he is a non-Jew, very successful man who survived and who was in camp and suffered tremendously as a Christian. And when in camp as a Christian, he created um, incredible music that did, did, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, dedication, no, in 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 self to the Christ. I mean, as a Christian, and I want to present this program at our Jewish community. The other point that I would like to do is to say, if I may, very 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 respectfully, is we we all need to find all those elements of education transfer them, readjust them, re-monitor them to be able to teach them and to create this better world, as I say, of Elie Wiesel, as he defined it. Tell us who's in the, who's your team? Okay, I, uh, I have uh, this movie, it's very interesting. We did this movie in two and a half years, just after the COVID. And uh, it was uh, a friend of mine, an artist, myself, in my home with a producer by the name of Jim Burkett. And Jim, uh, Jim uh, Clint, Clint Burkett, and it was absolutely incredible. And uh, join us later on was Alan Markovitz, who is an IMAX produ producer for these last 30 years. I am currently trying to work with Yad Vashem in taking over this project or I'm, and, and developing it. And uh, I came up with an, <laughs> with an idea to say, I'm lucky to have a guy like an IMAX producer. How can we create an alliance and do an IMAX movie today between an organization such as Yad Vashem or the Washington Museum and make it an IMAX movie which can be exposed to the whole world? The point that we have done for so many years is to address only our community. We have raised our children. We have created an awareness among many, many Jewish communities. But I, I, and I don't know how to do it, guys. It's not that I'm trying to direct anybody. But how can we find a way all together to send this message to to have a non-Jew understanding what we have lived? And today we have non-Jews and we have Muslims who are living the horrors of what we can call a genocide and that we don't want to call as a genocide. All right, hold on a second. I want to let everyone know that Jackie is going to be presenting in September with Sammy Steidman, who is also a survivor uh, in our September program. So there'll be a lot more for Jackie to talk about. I also saw a hand somewhere. Uh, I saw Ruth, you're waving at me. So if you are on the mic, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to say that I have been speaking since 1983 to mostly students in school and telling them my little story of having survived in Vienna. I have only been asked maybe once during that whole time to speak to a Jewish group. The Jewish schools in Portland and around uh, California here have never invited me. I've talked only to uh, middle schools and high schools and maybe a church group here and there. And I've often brought this up and I have a answer for this one. Why aren't the Jewish organizations asking for speakers that remember the Holocaust or had survived? Interesting. Because there's Jewish mothers and they are afraid their children are gonna get damaged. Right, right. I, having being a Jewish mother, I understand them totally, but we are not helping our children by uh, sheltering them. They need to know. Well, as you know, I brought the Butterfly Project to our group many times. 
And the Butterfly Project is designed to go to Jewish schools and non-Jewish schools and to present the Holocaust. So there, it is happening. I don't know why it's not happening in Oregon, but certainly uh, there are Jewish uh, schools listening and bringing students, bringing speakers to those schools as well as non-Jews. They created a petition. There should be a mandate in all 50 states and there is not. Okay, yeah. I, I want to give this, I want to give the last question to my good friend, uh, Judith up there in the corner up here. So raise and unmute yourself and you'll have the last question. We are going way over time. So uh, this program is almost three hours into the program. So this will be the last question. Sorry, Jackie. Thank you so much, Jeff, for everything that you're doing. This program has been absolutely wonderful. All the presenters and, and all the people responding to the presenters, amazing. I just would like to pull together a few threads that were evoked in me from what was said that um, for the creatives and the and this is a lot about creativity, not just sewing is also creating. And um, uh, my mother was in Feldefink and uh, while she was there, she was taught a song by her cousin, uh, one of the Ziegelbaum brothers, who, who learned, there was a very famous Yiddish opera, operetta writer. He wrote plays and movies. And he, his most famous song was named Ghetto. And um, my, they, my, the, my cousin taught it to my mother. And then, Many years later, and she would sing it at Holocaust memorials and various things. And many years later, they on the Ort World Ort website put up a whole article about this composer. And I looked at it, and because my mother said, "Look it up," because I'm giving a I'm singing the song. I'd like to speak about him. And I see they don't have the song. They have all these uh, opera singers singing various songs from different Jewish writers. So I contacted the, the um, professor who is running the project. I said, you know, not only do I have the lyrics and the translation and the transliteration, but I also have a recording of my mother singing it at the Holocaust Museum in Washington where they honored my family. So she said, great, you know, I had, I had a broadcast quality recording that my producer made from the videotape. You know, it's a whole, a lot goes into it. So it's up right now in World Ort. That's Holocaust, you know, dot world, whatever mm -hmm. it is, the, the website. And that was because of, you know, we, we, we preserved a piece of, art that wouldn't have been preserved because my mother heard it in Feldefink and kept it. And, you know, so I just wanted to share that with everybody. And um, the other thing I wanted to share is that um, my father was also trained as a tailor. I wasn't sure exactly where he was trained, but when we later, when I was growing, I was a little girl, we lived on a an egg farm, a chicken farm in New Jersey. And my father worked as a tailor in New York in the garment industry. And he worked for a company called Originala, which made, if you want to call it copies, but there was all the famous fashion designers. And I would wear Chanel suits <laughs> to the synagogue, you know, from, from the farm. <laughs> well, it worked for Jackie Kennedy. She had copies of Chanel. Well, my father made clothes for the Kennedys in, as the years passed, he was with a different designer and they made clothes for the Kennedys and for the ambassadors and everybody. So he was doing all that and he loved to sew. He was always sewing when he, when he could, you know, when he wasn't doing all the work that had been done, but he was so for us, so for my mother, you know. So anyway, this, what you're doing, talking about the women who sewed, this is their love, this is their heart, this is their, all their creativity they put into, into this. And it really is art. And, and it goes along with, with the people talking about singing and music and painting. And it's, it's I, I really believe that. I still have clothes I wear now that my father made for me. When, you know, what can I say? I wanna also I let you, I wanna also let everyone know that both Jackie and Judith have done uh, a uh, podcast uh, podcast series with me. So you can learn about their whole story uh, if you go to the podcast network. 
uh, for the Jewish culture and Holocaust remembrance obligation of memory. I also want to let everyone know that Judith is a clinical psychologist, but she <laughs> is a singer and sings beautiful uh, music in her synagogues and around Chicago. And believe it or not, I didn't know either one of these people before the, this whole thing started. And Mark Newhouse, who is a, uh, a, a winning uh, author, was also uh, the teacher of the year in the New York school system. Um, his parents came out of the Love uh, ghetto. Judith's parents came out of the Love ghetto and they're now talking to each other. So the power of bringing this community together through what we're doing here is, is, is an intangible, I, I just don't even know. And Jackie, I know you have your hand up. You have to be brief because we can't- Very brief, very hours. brief. Okay. I publish in 2014, I published my memoir. I'm just publishing just out a book called The Antiphonary of Love. It's about music. It's about love. It's a book that I want to offer to any of you who would like to read it just because it's about love and the love it's not sellable. Love is not balanced with money. You might like it. It's a little bit about my life too. And I put my email. If you want it, just write me a note. You can check on the web first. Thank you. Right, Thank you, everyone. Jeffrey. Everyone, I want to let you know. I put in the I put in the chat that our next meet, uh, next event is going to be on the fourteenth of August. We have three fabulous presenters. A little bit different, a little, uh, and I, and you can see the titles there, um, also uh, there. And our event for September is coming up, and that's Jackie and Sammy. Um, anybody who has a story who wants to tell over a series of uh, interviews with me, get a hold of me through private message or my email, jefftheBaker at gmail.com, and I'll be happy to uh, uh, talk to you about the Obligations of Memory podcast interview. It has been an amazing uh, journey. I, I am now so far behind. I'm now booking interviews for January. So I have no idea what is happening other than I think this is a Lador Vador experience for people. So I want to thank all of you for your contribution here today. It was such a meaningful program. Uh, they just get better and better and better. Um, so thank you. Have a nice rest of your day. The recording will be on the YouTube channel tomorrow. Um, so you'll be able to share it and bring anybody that you want to to hear it. So it's it's available to everyone. Thank you all. You're my friends. All of you. Appreciate all of you. Um, take care. Love. Bye, gesund und stark, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, Jeffrey. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.